Hello and welcome to this, which is our second webinar of the Smart Building Series uh, for 2019. Uh, and I am, or we, I should say, are talking about the current status of cybersecurity in the building automation industry. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started. Obviously, uh, this is going to be an interactive uh, webinar. We're going to have a presentation for the first half an hour, and then um, it would be great if uh, people want to contribute. So please put your questions in, type them in. Um, I'll get them here, and um, I can put them to, uh, to either myself or our guest today. Uh, and uh, and also um, need to say thank you to uh, Project Haystack and specifically uh, the Haystack Connect conference, which is going to be in San Diego in May. You can see on your screen now, um, if you go to haystackconnect.org, you'll find out more information about that. Thoroughly recommend um, anyone interested in building automation or semantic tagging of IoT data, get involved in that. It's, um, it's a great project. So let me introduce my two um, esteemed guests today. They are, um, what should I say, seasoned building automation campaigners. <laughs> uh, two <laughs> real industry guys. Uh, first of all, Anto Bajarajo. Hi, Anto. Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. And also Jim Lee from Symmetrics. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi, Anto. So I, uh, without further ado, I'm going to let you guys uh, take over and let's, uh, let's talk about what's going on with uh, cybersecurity at the moment in building automation. Okay, thank you, Jim. I'm, I'm going to kick things off. If you can uh, go to the next slide. Um, so this webinar is in some way in, uh, as a follow-up to the cybersecurity summit that uh, we organized during the AHR Expo in Atlanta what, two or three weeks back now. Um, and uh, it was a, a really uh, great event. Uh, it was held at seven o'clock in the morning on a Monday, which was amazing that anybody turned up at all. But we had uh, over the period of three hours, we had about I think about 100 people in, in the room. So it was really good turnout, which uh, goes to show the importance of this subject. That's kind of my, my take. On it. And uh, the, the summit was sponsored by these, these companies that you see on the screen. Uh, they're obviously leading the charge on, on the subject. If you go to the next slide. So um, this, this summit was organized by New Deal for Building. So I, I think it would be um, wise to spend a couple of minutes just explaining what that is and how we got to um, organizing the cybersecurity summit. So the New Deal for Buildings was an initiative uh, that um, Jim Lee and I started uh, about 18 months ago now, in the 2017, uh, when we were trying to sort of figure out the route to market question uh, with regards to intelligent building technologies that um, many people are um, um, uh, marketing to, to, the, to, the, to the space. And if you can go to the next slide, the, the, the problem that um, it really came down to, the, the way we looked at it, was that there's something broken with the relationship between the vendors and the client, the building owners, operators, or facility managers, whatever you want to call them. Um, and there's, there's something not quite right here. And so what we decided to do 18 months ago is to create a blog uh, to, start, to start a dialogue about this subject, about you know, what's really going on and how we can actually understand that and improve it. Uh, so the blog is on newdeal.blog. Uh, and uh, there's about over a dozen people that have um, uh, written on, on the site, um, everything from semantic tagging that uh, Jim was talking about earlier to cybersecurity and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so I, um, I would recommend that you, you, you read that. Um, slide. So one of the things that we started to think about is, is in, in the New Deal is kind of the landscape of this problem that we're trying to um, talk about and address. And if you sort of start to think about the, 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 the full landscape of what happens in a building during its operation, um, you really see three groups of people, three industries, three mega industries um, that are coming together. Uh, the first is what you see at the bottom there, the, uh, the building, the automation systems. Um, that go all the way from lighting to HVAC to environment and energy, all the way to um, uh, 
um, security, physical security and CCTV. So these are the systems that actually operate the building for years and decades um, in, its, in its lifetime. Right? So these are the systems. So over on the left, the green um, ovals uh, represent the information technology that is increasingly coming into the building space. Um, we've obviously talked about big data and analytics, and we're now talking about cybersecurity on this in this conference and uh, this uh, webinar. So there's a whole bunch of so there is a sort of a big industry that that is information technology that is starting to interact with uh, with buildings and facilities. And on the right um, are the services. So these are the facility managers, the um, real estate property management, uh, hospitality, um, guest services, and all those things. And these are really the people, the men, the men and women that actually enable um, enable uh, the building and the facility to operate over its lifetime. All right. So these are, if you think about it, these are the three groups of people that are sort of converging in this um, in, at this time when, where uh, technology is being applied to buildings. All right. So um, the the convergence, the sort of place where these uh, interact, is this vacant. Um, triangle in the middle. So, Jim, if you can click on the slide. Um, what we decided to do is that, you know, everything has to have a name. I, I learned that a long time ago. So, we kind of um, felt that it was uh, important to give this thing a title, and Facility IT is the title that we came up with. And um, if you uh, click the slide again, Jim. Uh, the definition of facility IT, the way we, we think about it, is the application of information technology to maximize the value of facilities for the owners and occupants. Right? Just sort of think about that for, for a while. And everything that we're talking about from semantic tagging to analytics to um, visitor management to room management, they're all a, 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 some type of use or application of information technology to make the facility better for either the owners or the occupants, right? So that's really the broad category that we uh, refer to as facility IT. Do you uh, conflict again, Tim? So um, with this, um, we start to have a tool to be able to sort of figure things out, trying to sort of see what's really going on and see where the problem areas are. And so in the context of security, which is what we started to do um, a few months back, um, we, we used this model to think about security. So um, if you can um, click on the slide, Jim. If we think about IT, the IT industry and cybersecurity, they're just sort of made for each other, right? Um, the, the IT infrastructure of any enterprise or any, any facility or any organization is um, hardened uh, with respect to cybersecurity, all right? Cyber, uh, um, IT, the IT, the IT industry spends nearly 10% of its budget on cybersecurity, on securing their systems, and we all know why, because that's where all our information is and, and everything else. So I don't think we need to get into that, right? So that's well known, right? So let's now, if you click again, Jim, let's now think about the facility management on the right-hand side. So as I mentioned earlier, these are really services, so these are really people. And they're just using um, typically cloud services or on-prem services uh, that may be uh, provided for them. So with regards to cybersecurity, there's really no issue with them because they're really using the same infrastructure as, the, as provided for by the, uh, the IT uh, people on the right-hand side. All right? so, as far as um, cybersecurity, the top two, the IT and the services, are really covered by the IT. And if you click again, uh, Jim, so this then leaves the, the stuff at the bottom. And this is where we, we really have a, a challenge on our hands because the, the systems uh, across the bottom there, most of the systems across the bottom, um, have really been around for, in some cases, 30 or 40 years in terms of the digital, uh, the, the, the birth of the DDC back in the 80s and, and everything that sort of evolved in, in, in terms of automating and controlling systems. And they've, they've all enjoyed um, security through obscurity, right? So they really haven't had to worry about security because nobody's really been able to um, or, uh, um, attack them because 
it's really, really hard because they're not connected to do anything like the internet, right? And so when it comes when it comes down to trying to think about facilities TIT where everything is connected, this then becomes a problem because the the industry as a whole, the industry that deals with all of those automation systems um, uh, at, the, at the bottom, are really not used to thinking about security. Um, and you know when when we see a lot of sort of discussions about IT OT conflicts and and um, people you know getting all heated up about um, integrating IT and OT, this is really what we're talking about. It's, we're talking about the IT industry thinking that the OT, the, the, the stuff at the bottom, are really um, a, 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 a vulnerable attack surface. So they, they're really treating it with great caution. Right? So this becomes a problem because for facility IT to work, everything has to, um, has to uh, work smoothly and information and data and information really needs to flow between these three sectors. So that was really the, the, the aha moment in terms of um, how we, we, we think about cyber security in the, the context of facility IT. And if you go to the next slide, Jim, and, and that is the, the rationale for putting together the cyber security summit. Um, we managed to get these nine individuals um, to, to um, uh, speak. Uh, it was a really um, a good conversation. I, I do um, recommend people watch the video. It's quite long, but it's, it's quite worth it if you're really interested in, in the subject. So with that, I'm going to hand over to um, Jim Lee. He was the, the chair of the summit, and um, I'll let him uh, introduce the, uh, the, the rest of the concepts that we, we talked about in, in the summit. Jim, over to you. Great, Antel. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Jim. So I, I'd like to uh, start out with a little historical timeline of uh, what's happened with security in the building automation space. Uh, there are there's sort of a, a false idea now that the building automation space has done nothing with security or has not contemplated security. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, but I would point out that we're not there yet with security, but a lot of work and a lot of thinking has gone into it. So starting, uh, you know, back at the beginning of time, the development of central heating and air conditioning, 1820, first air conditioned office building in San Antonio, Texas in 1926. We had interoperable mechanic controls, mechanical controls that gave way to pneumatic controls, which were also interoperable. And starting about the uh, Arab oil embargo, the energy shock of 1973, uh, many computers began to be overlaid over those pneumatic systems, uh, introducing a uh, uh, proprietary technology that was not interoperable. Uh, and starting in around 1983, 1984, the beginning of real direct digital control or basically microprocessor-based control down to the terminal devices uh, began in earnest. So we're talking about real computer networks uh, going out to devices. And uh, once again, uh, completely proprietary uh, security through obscurity. And that leads to a huge backlash. And uh, by 1987, uh, the ASHRAE BACnet committee is uh, formed and BACnet released in 1995 to standardize the digital communication and proprietary lock-in models, etc. But with open networks uh, come open problems because now everyone has the standards to find out what's going on on the wire. But uh, uh, there was another trend going on at this time, which is basically the birth of the internet. And remember, BACnet uh, was actually designed uh, before the internet existed. And uh, it was actually not clear at that time, if anyone remembers back, uh, Novell Networks and uh, the uh, uh, ISO model in Europe were vying for control of the networking space. And it ends up that uh, TCP IP won that race. And uh, that's what the internet is based on today. So it turns out that we in the building automation business knew all of these trends and it was very clear that there was a lot of demand to put building automation data over existing network infrastructure. To that end, uh, BACnet IP was started, Annex J, which, which allowed people to put their building automation data 
directly on the internet using UDP. Well, now everything's wide open to the world and people decided at that time that they needed some kind of security. So the security that started to be employed starting around the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, were virtual private networks, uh, which gave way later to VLANs. And the idea here is to uh, basically wrap what you have, contain all of the, uh, the information in a secure virtual private network or virtual LAN so that people can get into it. Uh, but what, once you're on the inside of that situation, uh, once you're on the inside of the VPN or the VLAN, everything is open. So uh, around 2002, uh, BTL listing begins. And by 2004, uh, people are really concerned about end-to-end -end security from end nodes within BACnet. So the idea is, okay, we've got a solution that's pretty good. We can, uh, you know, at least create these VPNs and keep everyone else out. Uh, but what if somebody gets inside? And so the idea was is that it was time for security down to the end node. And uh, so BACnet Addendum G was started around the 2004 time frame to provide end-to-end -end security uh, from uh, BACnet nodes uh, to BACnet nodes inside a system. Now by 2009, it had become pretty clear to us that uh, that uh, it was going to be very difficult for an internal standard to this industry to get taken seriously by the IT world, which by this point was much bigger and more entrenched and moving much more rapidly. And one thing you'll learn about security as you, as you learn about it is, is that it's really a moving target. A lot of the technologies are advancing very quickly. So it was decided by a number of us in the industry. Uh, Cisco at that time had entered the building automation space. And we decided to partner with Cisco to bring a IT friendly, secure variant of BACnet that used existing IT technology to the market. And that was the beginning of the BACnet IT working group, uh, which uh, Jim Butler uh, is the uh, is the chair, and for the next ten years, on the ASHRAE BACnet committee, a security standard has been hashed out. That security standard is called BACnet SC, or BACnet Secure Connect, and it is currently under public review, and we expect it to be uh, ratified uh, sometime uh, this year. So uh, that's that's basically the history of things. But I think that the key thing to understand is that although the building automation industry is quite large, it's quite small compared to the IT industry. And in fact, if you look at who makes the rules in this space, it's the IT industry. So the idea of synchronizing what we do, to IT standards is very important. And we've now put ourselves on a path where uh, that will be the case going on into the future. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So security is a very, very complicated problem. And uh, one of the things that's really important to point out is a lot of that problem is not technology based. It's actually human based. And uh, to get good coverage of the problem uh, is quite challenging. So it turns out that the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology did a bunch of uh, fundamental work to think about the, the security problem and have divided the entire problem of cybersecurity into these five different categories. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So if you look at some of these things, for instance, in the identify category, asset management, business environment, risk assessment, this is basically understanding what you even have to secure. And if you start in, in buildings, uh, what you'll find is uh, the automation systems are often neglected and uh, people don't actually know exactly what they have. So as a starting point, uh, really a, a survey of the assets and what you have is a good place to start. Then there's a quick question of how do we protect these things? 
How do we uh, detect anomalies and events? What do I do when something goes wrong? And how do I recover if there's a disaster? Well, it turns out that VetNet SC, although it's a, a great technology, it only covers uh, a couple of these categories. And because of that, it's really incumbent upon the rest of us in the industry to solve, to, to, pr to bring a complete solution to building owners. And uh, that's, uh, that's really what we're, we're doing as an industry right now. And one of the reasons for hosting this uh, summit and the follow on is to nucleate a dialogue about uh, what the elements of this solution will be and uh, to try to figure out who's going to provide those elements uh, of the solution. Okay, next slide, please. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what BACnet SC is just for a moment. And uh, I'd like to point out that if you uh, go to uh, BACnet.org or just Google uh, BACnet SC white paper, uh, the BACnet committee and elements have prepared uh, an excellent white paper, uh, which will give you more of a technical introduction. So please uh, feel free to check that out. Next slide, please. So BACnet Secure Connect is a secure BACnet communication for TCPI network, TCP IP networks. So it's using standard TCP IP networks uh, security, so transport layer security. Messages are encrypted and devices are authenticated using certificates. So basically uh, every device has a certificate. So you can imagine that as an industry, we need to learn how to deal with those certificates. Uh, it's compatible with existing BACnet installations in that a router will be needed to route between legacy BACnet and BACnet SC. And it supports both IPv4 and IPv6. Next slide. So centralized BACnet SC hubs are used instead of the distributed uh, BACnet broadcast management devices which are currently used to uh, span segments on the internet. So one or two hubs per BACnet SC network uh, are used. There's a primary hub and a failover hub. Uh, and these hubs may be boxes locally, or they may also be in the cloud, or one might be there locally in case the internet connection gets cut and one in the cloud. But the, uh, the BACnet SC hub effectively supervises uh, BACnet Secure Connect uh, for a particular installation. So every BACnet SC device has a unique cer certificate and that's signed by the site's designated certificate authority. And uh, it can be deployed in virtual LANs or VPNs as well as in secure networks. So if I've got my entire building automation system already running in a VLAN, I can still run BACnet SC inside of that and get even more security. Or if I don't have a VLAN or VPN, I can get uh, traditional IT security uh, using uh, BACnet SC. Next slide. So to the point that we haven't been doing anything, uh, this group of people has been working tirelessly for 10 years to create this technology. So as you can see, it's a, a group of people from many companies across the industry, and, uh, including the uh, IT participants. So we're doing the best we can to uh, get out of our own uh, box and, and listen to what other people are saying. Uh, in addition to that, I would point out that the standard has gone through many public reviews already. And there actually have been some interoperability testing uh, sessions to uh, make sure that it works in advance. So we do expect that over the course of the, uh, the next few years, the technology will be rolled out quite quickly. And Anto in a moment is going to uh, discuss uh, how we see those ecosystems forming in the industry and how we see things unfolding a little more. Next slide. So finally, I, I mentioned uh, if we look at security categories that are addressed by BACnet SC, 
It's primarily authentication and encryption. But components of security that BAT at SC doesn't solve yet are authorization, uh, software updates to address vulnerabilities. So one of the key things about security is how do you, uh, uh, you know, have Microsoft or uh, Apple update your software to address security vulnerabilities. Uh, we need to have that same functionality even in these deeply embedded devices. Uh, vulnerability detection, intrusion, intrusion detection, uh, network management and monitoring. So these are all elements that, uh, that are going to need to be provided. And uh, as an industry, we're, we're working towards understanding that now. And potentially uh, uh, technologies like OAuth may be used for authorization. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many other uh, intrusion detection and network management schemes on the IT side that may be applied as well. But right now we're, we're in the middle of this dialogue and uh, uh, that's why we're uh, out there talking to people and uh, having these forums. So I, at that point, I, I guess I'd like to uh, turn it over back to Anto and he can uh, talk to you about uh, how we're putting such things together. Thanks, Jim. If you can move the slide. Yeah, this, this, uh, at the summit, this was actually presented by Andy McMillan, president of um, Backnet International. Um, if you've ever seen Andy speak, he often colors everything, so I'm not gonna do that part because I'm not Andy. So we go to the next slide. So really the, the, the objective of this part of the conversation is what are we gonna do? You know, what are we as the industry going to do? How, we, how do we need to organize ourselves so that we fix this problem in a way that the, the, the systems, the auto, building automation systems, the systems that um, a lot of us care deeply about can be regarded as secure. We do all the right things so that the IT um, uh, community can actually uh, trust those systems and trust the people behind it. And if you, if you think about that problem, it's, it's a lot of it is about um, aligning the different interests, right? There are different um, stakeholders in, in this industry, everything, everybody from uh, technology manufacturers such as Jim at Symmetrics to uh, cloud service analytics to control um, companies to integrators and all the way to building owners and facility managers, right? So. So in, in a way, all, a lot of those, or maybe all of those um, the different stakeholders really need to um, somehow have some kind of common goal. And that's really the first point that um, Andy wanted to, to make sure is that we, we figure out some alignment of um, what we need to do, how we need to position this industry to be, to be regarded as, as uh, an industry that is um, responsible with respect to cybersecurity. So a lot of it is um, uh, it's about goal alignment. Um, a lot of it is about um, identification uh, of the audiences. Um, you know, the, all the different stakeholders that I mentioned just now, they all have different needs, right? So it's important for, for us as the industry or as, uh, as thought leaders to try and figure out how, how does um, making the industry more uh, secure with respect to cybersecurity how does that impact, for example, an integrator? What, the, what does an integrator need to do to, to um, do their part so they can themselves look um, uh, good in the eyes of the IT people that they have to deal with, but also help the industry um, uh, look good and, and be able to, to, to act responsibly? Um, so that is a, uh, another very, very key point is to be very sensitive to the different needs. Um, timeline. Timelines is going to be probably a, a challenge for us because um, Jim Lee just talked about that the 10 years it's taken us to get here and with, uh, with respect to backend SC and we're not even here yet because we're still maybe a, a year away from, from the final release. Um, I, I think everybody that's dealt with IT knows that IT, you know, uh, the, the speed at which I, things happen in IT is very fast. So how do we you know, align those timelines with, uh, with each other. And, you know, the, the, the other part of the timeline is buildings last forever. Buildings last for decades. And therefore, a lot of the control systems uh, that are in, in buildings um, have been in buildings for, you know, 10, 20 years, maybe, maybe more. So there's lots, lots of issues there. Um, 
obviously trying to leverage existing organizations. There are many different organizations in, in this uh, in this industry. Um, Backnet International being one um, organization, such as Kaba, which we did a we meaning the the New Deal for Buildings did a, a partnership with to actually create a white paper about the New Deal uh, about a year ago. Um, and there are many other organizations. How do we, we we actually need to bring those those people together? And, and obviously. Um, Respecting the the, the, the people's uh, uh, perspective in, in all of this, and keeping an open mind about how we can solve the problem. Um, slide, please, Jim. Um, I'm just this is just kind of just going into a little bit more detail in terms of the supply side, um, the market awareness, and you know where at some point there will be a tipping point. You know when when is that going to be? I mean it's likely to be. Maybe at the end of this year, but prediction is, is is always questionable. But at the end of this year, we have the sort of the the potential release or finalization of Backnet SC, and that may well be um, uh, that may trigger the sort of the tipping point of of how we deal with cybersecurity. Um, and I'm not going to go through each one of these. There's a, a lot of things that um, uh, Jim Lee already covered. Um, but also the, the last point is the, the development and uh, um, of, of products um, also takes time. You know, when, so when a control um, company produces a product, it needs to go into the market. There needs to be education of a whole bunch of other sort of um, information that needs to be disseminated. So there are some challenges specifically on the supply side. And if you go to the next slide, Jim. And there are some challenges on the owner side, the owner operator. Um, and um, a lot of it's to do with uh, best practice, trying to understand what to do, uh, how how to do things and how to approach things. You know, how, there's, there's a facility manager at the at the uh, at the building or, or facility. How does he or she know if his particular building is actually vulnerable at any given point? You know, what what tools uh, do they use to do that? In amongst all of the different tools that they actually need to operate the building. Right. So those kind of things. And obviously the relationship with the, the IT people. And that, this is going to um, uh, trigger a whole bunch of case studies and, and again, the di dissemination of information about how, how we should uh, move forward. Right. So, so as, as Jim Lee mentioned earlier, this is a start of the conversation about cybersecurity. That's really the, the, the purpose of the summit. Um, and uh, we really need to keep a, an open mind over the next year or two um, as, as an industry to help this um, uh, position this industry to be um, one that is respected by the IT community with regards uh, to cybersecurity. So um, if you go to the next slide, I think that's, yeah, that, that's um, pretty much the end of the, the presentation. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the, there is a video of the whole three hour um, summit that um, if you go to summit uh, .new deal blog you'll be able to see the video great so and with that I'm gonna hand it over to Jim to thanks very much the guys. Discussion. and the, the video is up on YouTube as well isn't it it's on YouTube and it's on that site um, as, uh, as well it's actually the YouTube video uh, embedded on that link that I put there great so as Anto said, um, now it's time to, to hear from uh, you guys. We'd love to have some questions or comments. Um, and now is a, you know, a, an opportunity now to talk to two guys who've got both decades of experience in the building automation industry. So uh, you really should take the opportunity to ask them. Uh, and of course, this is a hugely important topic for the industry. Um, you know, as uh, as the guys mentioned, this is uh, something we need to uh, we need to consider very carefully uh, how we can secure that. And I think obviously Backnet have done a fantastic job uh, so far. So um, so yeah, type your questions in, and uh, we've got about twenty five minutes. Um, some things from my side, uh, guys. Some interesting. You know, you talked uh, initially, sort of like framing the problem, and we looked at the, the history of it, which I thought was. Was super interesting, and and you mentioned, of course, about the security being IT led. I mean, is there? I, I take it when this has been Banger SC is being developed, you've been trying to use IT industry techniques and, and standards. 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I'll uh, I'll take that for a minute, Jim Lee here. So uh, the answer is is that from the outset, the idea of BACnet IT and now BACnet Secure Connect was to use existing IT technology standards to secure building automation data. So BACnet SC is really a new data link layer for BACnet. Uh, it uses uh, web sockets and is once again TLS. So basically the basic, uh, the same internet security protocols that secure your browsers. It's the uh, most mainstream technology that we can use. And the, th the key thing here is that as those IT technologies evolve, and we're sure they will, uh, the design of BACnet SC is modular enough that it will uh, basically gracefully uh, move forward with those IT standards as they evolve. So we hope from here on out, we're going to have the uh, latest and greatest best IT security underpinning BACnet. And, and you mentioned certificates as well, that it uses uh, that to secure, I guess, to secure the uh, the packets going back and forth. Is is that, again, is that um, uh, public key PKI stuff? Yeah. Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, I think that if you think about uh, the future and Antos, back to Antos facility IT slide for a minute, who's going to be responsible for those certificates? Will it be the local contractor? Will it be the owner's IT department? What happens if the owner doesn't have an IT department? Uh, if the local building contractor is the only one that holds those certificates, uh, you've basically undone 30 years worth of open systems in the industry. You basically had you've the system and handed it back to the integrator or the local building contractor. So really the, the policy that we need to develop for who has the keys, who controls the keys going forward, uh, that's a lot of process. And that process is gonna be very dependent on the kind of customer concerned. Mm -hmm. Yep, so there's flexibility, of course, built in for different types of customer and different types of, of, uh, of, of manufacturer. Absolutely, but the business process is not well understood. Mm -hmm. you know, the and, and, uh, uh, if, is understandable. The business process hasn't even, uh, hasn't even been discussed in the industry yet. So if I can chime in, you know, the, this issue about the different stakeholders, right? So if you think about keys, right, who's going to handle the keys, right? The, the manufacturer of the system, whatever the system is, has to obviously deal with that. The control controllers themselves, the devices have to understand keys and, and, and have, have to be able to be, their keys to be managed. And then the integrators need to understand how to do that. and. Uh, both business process, process and best practices, and they, they have to uh, be trained on how to do that, and all the way to the facility manager. So even if you take a, one specific topic such as keys, it really needs to go um, almost all the way across the, the, the stakeholders. And there are that's not the only issue. There are other other issues. So it, it's a it's a pretty um, complex thing that really can't be. It cannot be solved by one one company or one individual or organization. It really needs to be a collaborative effort by the industry. Right, absolutely. Uh, you also uh, guys mentioned a few resources um, during uh, the talk. I'll, I'll put some links up on um, you know when we publish these slides and, and the video online. Uh, but you mentioned it, it's it's under public review at the moment. Is that right, Backnet SC? That's correct. So where can people go to get uh, some information about that or perhaps con contribute um, some thoughts? So the, uh, the open ASHRAE committee process, uh, which uh, anyone can uh, uh, come and attend meetings, uh, make public comments. Uh, and in fact, uh, the best way to, to find out what's going on in the BACnet world in general is the uh, BACnet committee's website, uh, which is BACnet.org. So I would recommend uh, people go there and you can see the latest on uh, uh, BACnet SC. And if anyone had a particular interest, I would also uh, encourage them to reach out directly to uh, Jim Butler, 
the uh, chief technology officer of Symmetrics, as he is the convener of the uh, BACnet IT subcommittee uh, under the auspices of ASHRAE. If anyone's interested, I can provide uh, Jim's contact information offline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, something I, th I thought at the end that um, was interesting was well, talking about the timeline, of course, because again, you know, we want to get this from from out into the wild now, I guess, right? That that's the aim of of next year, of, of, of sort of this year, twenty nineteen. Uh, um, and you mentioned things like implementation training, and I, I mean, how do you how do you envisage that happening from your perspective? Um, how can people, you know, get really get their hands on this and start and start testing and, and getting involved? Well, I, I think that uh, that there are many different companies uh, that have different positions in the industry, uh, but from the perspective of Symmetrics, uh, we have about a sixty percent market share of protocol stacks for BACnet worldwide in HVAC controls fire alarm, security system, lighting controls, et cetera. And our, our goal is to implement BACnet SC completely in our protocol stack products and uh, roll that out to the market. So as soon as BACnet SC is released by the committee, we intend to have uh, a variant of BACnet SC in our products ready to ship. Now, the problem comes in is, okay, pretty straightforward and we can get to market with that quickly. But as I mentioned uh, previously, BACnet SC really only solves uh, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the security problem. Mm. And because of that, uh, Symmetrics has come out with an entire cybersecurity framework that we call Secured by Symmetrics. And uh, this framework aims to solve many of the other problems uh, maybe not all of them, but many of the other problems uh, that we can solve uh, through technology and business practice around security. And uh, in a, we announced that uh, Secured by Symmetrics framework, and we're hoping that by, by using the leverage of the protocol stacks and uh, the leverage that we have in the industry that we can greatly accelerate the deployment of technology. Right, and yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, as, as you say, this this is uh, this is not just one issue, is it? It's not just about technology. It's 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 also a human based problem. So, it's about having the right knowledge, right, at the the right time, and making sure that we commission these systems correctly and and that the, the, they're updated. Yeah, and, and as as an uh, sort of the structure of the industry, right? So. Um, in, in a way, we've been used to the sort of scenario where a company can come up with a really neat product and, you know, change the industry or impact the industry. With cybersecurity, it's kind of a little bit different. It's, it, you know, different different companies will need to um, approach the this, this problem or solving problem in a very different way, in a collaborative way, because if you think about a system, if you look at a, a, a system, a co very complex system that is in a building, it will involve lots of different vendors, right? It may have some uh, analytics software, it may have controls, it may have some GUI from a different vendor, it may have some uh, bespoke system from an integrator, right? So you, you have all of these different systems and um, for, for if, if you look at it from a functionality point of view, somebody can create um, a, an application or something that, that will then be valuable to, to, the, to the client, right? But when you're looking at the cybersecurity perspective, all of these different systems will have to somehow abide by um, different, uh, not different, uh, abide by common and um, good um, practices in terms of cybersecurity, right? So. The, the whole notion of a surface attack is that you just need one little um, crack in that in that um, uh, that barrier that that wall that firewall as, as it were and that undermines the cybersecurity of that the whole building mm. right so it really is is really is um, uh, very much a, an industry collaboration that's needed here to make sure that um, everything is is uh, is covered not just your piece whatever that piece is and that that's that's what's sort of interesting about 
what Symmetrix is doing with the skewed by Symmetrix thing, because it, it's working to create a framework that will help everybody from integrators to facility managers to, to vendors of, of control systems. And um, I think there are different uh, other companies that are, come, that are doing different things, but um, we, we, we have a, an obligation as, a, as an industry to coordinate a lot of these uh, activities to make sure that it addresses the, the, the problem the way the IT people uh, needs to see it. Yeah, no, that's um, that's a fantastic point. Where where can um, if people want more information about this the framework, uh, where can where can they get that the symmetric framework for security? We'll be uh, releasing more information on the framework in the next few months. Okay. For uh, for the uh, BACnet SC standard to go a little further forward in its next public review before we start uh, releasing. But I would uh, keep your eye on the uh, Symmetrics website in about uh, one to two months time, start releasing more. Great, um, and that's good I think, it's obviously good timing to do these things together. Uh, what, well, yes, so, uh, questions please. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, this is, a, as I said, a great opportunity to ask any BACnet or building automation um, related questions. So, uh, so please, please put them in if you have any. Um, I think as well, I just, um, I was interested, um, uh, you mentioned right at the end about sort of the product development. I think it was the, let's see the last slide. Uh, how, how, again, I, and I, I think that it's part of the timeline, right? This uh, of getting of getting manufacturers to you know to take this new standard on. And how how does that process actually work when people want to bring um, you know a new a new product to market and want to use BACnet? Could you could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is is that if you uh, go back to the uh, slide, which shows all of the companies that are participating in the uh, BACnet SC process, what you'll find is that this is a, uh, a group of people that has been working that one, uh, that one, uh, with the, uh, yes. The, uh, these people have been working together for 30 years on this technology, and it's a very collaborative environment. And although these uh, are uh, competitors, what you'll find is under the auspices of ASHRAE, and the uh, open public forums, uh, people actually generate uh, interoperability testing sessions. So everyone actually implements the technology and then it's tested together. Uh, we have uh, both face-to-face -face testing and uh, uh, online testing. And a lot of this is uh, also done in conjunction with BACnet International. So all the manufacturers have the standards uh, whether they're a, uh, a Symmetrics protocol stack customer, so they just get it automatically by using that, or whether they, they've uh, created their own protocol stack or bought a protocol stack from one of our competitors, those, those implementations are taken together and then tested so that we can actually deliver working products to the industry in advance of uh, those products uh, being heavily marketed. So the kinds of things that we're talking about will be occupying uh, 2019 and 2020. So by the time uh, real products are ready for market, it will probably be more along the ends of 2020 or 2021. And at that point, we would expect a process with BACnet International to uh, provide some kind of open testing, at least of the BACnet elements of, uh, of uh, BACnet SC so that, uh, that we can ensure interoperability with the, uh, with the BTL mark process. That answer that a little bit? Yes, it does. We've got some email. So, so, Sorry, let, go on. Let me just add another perspective on that. Again, you know, there's a thread here that BACnet SC is a great thing and it's, it's something that this, this industry needs, but it's not everything, right? So if you, if you, if you take something as simple as at some point, if you have a system or a device, somebody's going to need to, a user is going to need to log into it, right? So one of the, the problems that um, uh, we, we see over and over again is the password, username, password, where the username is admin and the password is either blank or the word password, right? Which is 
from a cybersecurity perspective is completely useless, obviously. Yeah. And so that's a problem that is inherent in how you design a product, right? And uh, Tridium, I think with their, with their latest release, there's, uh, they've made a lot of noise about the fact that they've just made a relatively simple change to that part of their product that the username is whatever the username is and the password is always different or it's always forced to be something um, that, that that the user can, can set, right? So that kind of uh, behavior in how you develop a product um, may actually be relatively simple to do, but it's kind of a, an example of, of how you need to start to think about security first and not security last, yeah, which is how, how, how I think we've been, in a way, trained by the, the luxury of not having to worry about security because we've been obscure. Right. right. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a change of mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Security first, but sort of bake it, try and bake it into the product. So we've got, some, right. uh, got a bunch of questions coming. So let's, uh, let's try and take these uh, before we end, guys. Uh, okay. First one here. From the standpoint of HVAC equipment manufacturers, is there a way to secure the appliance itself, both to prevent intrusion into the network and attack from within the network? Uh, I'm wondering whether the question is about physical, um, physical security of the equipment. And if that's the angle of the question, then the answer has to be yes, because I think that's that's quite often forgotten. Again, it's a, it's a, it's almost a detail. But you know, if, if you have a an exposed socket, or whether an Ethernet socket or a RS four eight five kind of socket, then maybe that's not such a good thing. So, it, do you think that's what they were talking about? The physical securing physically the the, mm -hmm. the equipment. Yes, I think it was sort of looking at it from a, from both perspectives there. Um, I've got a longer question here. Despite the push within the built environment we're all doing, um, I believe the majority in our industry continue to ignore cyber. Uh, we need to look at cybersecurity as a business issue. The operational, financial, and reputational impact to the business is tremendous, and it's on all of us to make cybersecurity a business case. Uh, it all comes, it all comes to one thing: uh, risk. How much are you willing to take? Um, I think that's uh, so obviously more of a comment there, but I definitely um, echo that that point. Um, it is a business. It is a business issue for sure. It, it is. I, I I saw a uh, quote. I can't remember where from. Um, they went something along the line that um, cybersecurity isn't an issue of protect protecting or securing something. It's a it's a it's a process of understanding the risk because it will never be zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So it's really under understanding um, uh, the risk. And I think that's a great point. Another question and comments here. Uh, BACnet SC is yet to be published. So uh, BACnet IP is still being installed and operated. Uh, true. What can a building owner operator do now to ensure the future roadmap for their BAS infrastructure is secure? Uh, when will vendors start to supply BACnet SC products? And is there a legacy fix for BACnet IP installs? Okay, I'll uh, I'll take that one for a minute. The comment that I think that uh, that products will appear be at the latter into uh, 2020 or 2021. Uh, as far as addressing legacy issues, uh, a uh, BACnet SC to BACnet IP router can be installed to bridge any uh, unsecured older network uh, into a secured network. And uh, finally, uh, before BACnet SC appears, I would highly recommend uh, continuing to use VLANs to uh, at least provide some uh, level of security for your networks. Mm -hmm. Yep, good point. I think there's another one here for you, Jim. Um, does each device or each BACnet uh, SC hub require a certificate? Um, are they self-signed or from a public uh, CA? Any wild... Uh, 
they uh, require a certificate. Mm -hmm. Public one. They are a public one, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, some more here. Um, is Bagna SC intended to take the place of VLAN functionality in a local network? Uh, it doesn't hurt to use the VLAN, but uh, I think that uh, you can, uh, yes, if you can you can get by without it if you have full uh, back that SC coverage. I, I would think that they're two different approaches to security, so they're not really, one doesn't replace the other necessarily. Right. So, I mean, you could use, I mean, you could use them in combination or. Right. Yeah. And there could be other, devi there could be other um, uh, devices on the network that, that are not BACnet. Right. But BACnet SC obviously won't, we're not going to do anything to help. Right. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, a final question here. Uh, we've we've got time, by the way, guys. So if there are more questions, um, put them in. I'm sorry if I've missed uh, if I've missed any out. Um, is BTL Lab prepared for the storm of possible requests? Um, how? Not sure what BTL Lab is myself, but is that one? Okay, so, so uh, BTL is the uh, Backnet Testing Laboratories. Okay. So in, uh, in uh, 1999, I founded. Uh, Backnet Manufacturers Association, which is now called Backnet International. Backnet Inter International runs the uh, testing regime for Backnet, which is called BTL or the Backnet Testing Laboratories. Uh, currently, the uh, Backnet International Group maintains a test manager, and there are outsourced uh, laboratories for testing in India and in Europe, uh, and maybe some others that I'm not aware of at this point. But product to those test labs uh, to uh, to be awarded the BTL mark. So in order for BACnet SC to be BTL tested, uh, the BACnet testing standard, which is governed by the ASHRAE BACnet committee, would have to be updated to provide uh, testing parameters for and then the labs would have to uh, put that into place. And uh, I know from talking to Andy McMillan uh, that there's uh, a lot of interest in uh, following this and doing that in the BACnet International Organization. Once again, Andy McMillan is president of that organization, so I'd, I'd need to let him take the question head on himself. But I, I'm I'm a thousand percent sure that uh, that group is watching this very carefully uh, and getting ready to act. Once again, the latency of acting is it takes some time for these committees to. Uh, to uh, go through their motions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that brings us to um, a pretty good, pretty good stop there. But of course, I mean, I'm sure you guys might think of uh, questions um, after this is over, or indeed, you know, if people are listening to this, um, you know, after the event. Um, uh, guys, is I mean, if they, if people really want to want to get involved or have additional questions, what's the best way of of reaching out? I think they can uh, reach out to uh, myself or Anto directly, and we would be happy to uh, plug them into the ecosystem. Okay, and the New Deal, and, New Deal blog as well. Yeah, the, the New Deal blog is, is um, where we can uh, post a lot of articles as this process continue over the, 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 the next few months. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, the stuff on um, on Twitter, on social media, and, and LinkedIn. There's a lot of um, uh, posts and discussions. So I think it's really just a question of being involved in, in all of this. This is kind of the way things happen these days. Um, so we would definitely welcome um, comments and ideas and suggestions. And if anybody out there wants to uh, write something for the New Deal blog, just reach out to uh, uh, to us and we can have a discussion. Good. This is very much a collaborative process, so so get involved. Yeah, and that includes you, Jim. Yeah, Jim okay. Mikhail. You're on. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it just remains me to say thank you to the guys here, Anto, Jim. Appreciate your time, and I think this is a very worthy cause. So um, 
I'm looking forward to seeing how it developed over this year. Well, thank you very much, Jim. We really appreciate it. And I will make sure that we will put, obviously this has been recorded, so we'll put the recording up and we'll share the links. Um, so feel free, um, I'll, I'll make sure that's available to everybody and uh, feel free to spread the word and share it with, with your colleagues. Thanks very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.